But as Lloyd told you, he wanted this panel to look at how to capitalise on health opportunities provided by globalisation. And we agreed that it would be important to frame this in the context of current global health landscape. So that's what I'm going to do. And then I'm going to look at some broader mega globalisation trends that present both opportunities, uh, but also threats, sometimes threats to, to global health. And I appreciate that there's a wide range of people here, which is fantastic. That's what we need for, for change to happen. Uh, so I'm sorry, some people this will be familiar to and others it probably won't be. So I just, to talk about the global health landscape, it has changed dramatically in the last period. I'm going to talk about five major changes. They do interrelate, but I'm going to talk about them as, as, as entities. Uh, and I don't have any overheads, I'm, so I'm just going to talk, uh, talk to it. The first one is around the global economic landscape. There has been rapid economic growth, as everyone knows, but also very major shifts about where that growth is occurring. And the global economic crisis of 2008, 9, 10, 11, depends on how long you thought it went on, really put a spotlight on the substantial shift in economic growth, particularly in Asia, away from the traditional centres of Europe and North America. Um, uh, in fact, the developed markets, which is what the traditional donor markets are called, and Europe and North America, Australia is part of that, but people tend to forget about Australia. Um, the growth has actually been below that with developed markets, uh, below that of emerging markets since the 1980s. But of course, the size of the economies of the, of the traditional donors was much greater. However, this has changed and it's changing very rapidly. The real marked difference has been since the year 2000, particularly with emerging markets in Asia, where annual growth is three times that um, of developed markets. And so this region of the world is where growth is really the strongest, um, and it's away from the traditional markets. And I think Bill's going to talk uh, a bit further about the implications this has for the region and what it means. It means it's a very exciting region to be in. The growth in, in, even in Africa is twice as much as in the traditional developed markets. Uh, and of particular note then, if we look forward for Australia, is projected growth in Indonesia, one of our nearest neighbours and, and one of our big aid recipients. Because by 2030 it's predicted that Indonesia will be the 11th largest world economy, well ahead of Australia, which will be the 17th largest economy. And by 2020, or indeed I think some would say now, China will be the world's largest economy, followed by the US and then India in third place. So what does this all mean for global health? Geopolitically, the donor-recipient division is really blurring fast. And consequently, this raises all sorts of quite deep policy questions. I think I'd probably be a, a policy po if I was going to put myself in one of those groups. Um, it raises really quite uh, profound questions about the nature and form of, assist of official development assistance. Um, the changes have led to a much stronger focus on responsibilities of domestic governments and domestic finance in what had been traditionally aid recipient countries. It's led to a much greater focus on transparency and on accountability, uh, on sustainable development and partnerships. Really, we talk about development now, not really aid. Uh, but also we talk about partnering. Um, and I think China's an interesting example. China has always made it very clear from the time they were sort of shifted from being a recipient uh, to now being um, a, a, an aid donor that they didn't see themselves in the traditional model. They didn't see a top-down donor model. They saw themselves as partnering. They didn't want to be part of what was seen as the sort of traditional top-down donor model. But the other thing that's happened, and this is significant as well, is that donors' appetite for risk has plummeted. I saw this working at the Global Fund and then at Gavi, um, where when I arrived at the Global Fund in 2005, there was a lot of enthusiasm. It was the, it was the year um, of the Paris principles, very strong focus on light, what was called light touch, on country driven, etc. Um, and that is just I must say, disappeared rapidly with the global economic crisis and the stagnation of many of these economies and the emerging market economies. Um, so while at the same time donors are talking about an increased emphasis on innovation, and I think innovation is incredibly important, but it's also used very um, 
uh, very loosely without people looking exactly at what that means. Uh, and so if you have diminishing risk but an increased focus on innovation, there's a bit of an inherent contradiction there because innovation by its very nature involves risk. So the change in the world economic uh, situation has a big impact. What's the second one? Demographically. Well, as a result of this economic growth, particularly the spectacular growth in countries such as China and India, but also countries like Indonesia, there's been a dramatic decrease in the number of people living in extreme poverty, which is fantastic news. According to the high-level panel on post-2015 development agenda that put out its report in 2014, or it might have been late 2013, leading up to the, all the discussions and consultations around the sustainable development goals, um, we've had the fastest reduction in poverty in human history. It's a pretty sweeping statement, but that's, that's what they say. Half a billion fewer people are living below the international extreme poverty line of US uh, $1.25 a day. And as a result of this, the health status of most people in most countries, I qualify that, has improved as a result of better resourcing of health services, technological developments, and improved living conditions arising from economic growth. So just let me give you a few numbers. 30% drop in the number of children dying before their, 50, before their fifth birthday. Deaths from malaria have fallen by a quarter. Life expectancy is increasing. And I think it's really important to stress that there have been successes and progress is possible because I think all too often, and particularly if you just looked at the news, you would think everything was doom and gloom and nothing was changing. And I also think there's a general perception out in the community that uh, the development assistance dollar is either wasted or doesn't make a difference. There has been huge progress. It's also led to a shift where people in poverty, living in poverty, live. So a majority of people living in poverty, using the World Bank definition, now live in middle-income countries or low-middle-income countries. Um, and this varies depending on the region. So in Asia, our bigger region, for instance, 56% of poor people in that region live in middle-income countries, whereas in Africa, only 34% live in middle-income countries. This highlights the fact that macroeconomic growth in a country alone doesn't ensure that every citizen benefits. And I think that, uh, Lloyd, you made the very strong point about equity. So there's internal equity within, there's equity between countries, but there's equity within countries. Um, there's still major inequities in access to income, basic services within countries, which then takes you into the realm of income distribution, social security schemes, including health insurance, and also the size of the public purse and tax revenue. Because if you have a very small tax base, you don't have a very large public purse. And this is a real issue in, in some of the, of the lowest income countries in the world. But if you look, for instance, to take an example of, of macroeconomic growth not necessarily then being distributed, Nigeria is the fastest growing economy in Africa. The figures last year, I think, said that 36%, it has a 36% growth rate. And yet, more than 75% of the population live on or below the poverty line. And we have a similar situation in PNG, but Bill was the expert on PNG. So this distribution issue of where poor people live also poses some challenging policy questions. We need to look at what's the major policy objective of a country's development assistance or an agency's program. So it's not just countries. This is about agencies, big agencies working in um, developing countries. So is the major objective to support the poorest countries, or actually countries hate that term, low-income countries, I think is a better term, or to support the poorest people irrespective of where they live? So what's the <coughs> global moral obligation to poor people living in non-poor countries? Um, and what's the obligation of the countries themselves? And in health, it poses the question of, is the primary purpose of assistance development, or is it public health um, to address the biggest need, irrespective of the income of the country? And in this very globally interconnected world, there's a very real question of global and national health security as well. So Ebola was a wake-up call. For, a while, for while it did occur in three low-income countries, it needed massive global effort, and it certainly posed a threat to other countries. And much nearer to home, uh, in PNG, actually in Port Borsby, we have 
multi-drug resistant TB. So there's some pretty major questions about the demographic shifts and then what is the role of countries and agencies in supporting them. Many of the low middle income countries are resource rich, often through very rapid commodity growth, which is now looking like it's levelling off, certainly that's the case in PNG, um, but they haven't necessarily invested in social infrastructure, including health and education. And health and education are absolutely, as Lloyd said, essential underpinnings of sustainable economic development. If, if you don't have your health, if your children are sick and you're not educated, the chances of being able to, to take advantage of growth and sustainable growth are very limited. Uh, it's a point that's not always understood, I have to say, by our politicians who talk about sustainable economic growth uh, without necessarily realising that health and education underpin it. The third major change of area is burden of disease. As the global population ages and lifestyles change, the share of mortality and morbidity caused by non-communicable diseases compared to infectious diseases is growing globally, although infectious diseases will still account for an important share of morbidity and mortality in developing countries, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa. And it comes to the point, once again, that you made, Lloyd, that non-communicable diseases very intimately involved with lifestyle and this isn't solved by just straight medical issues. It's right across. It's a very multi-sectoral, multidisciplinary approach. So this shift in the burden of disease is one of the consequences of rapid ageing of populations where the ratio of children to older citizens in, is declining and there's a rise in longevity. This varies a lot between countries and regions. So for instance, this shift is happening rapidly in Japan and Europe, um, but it varies in emerging economies. So for instance, it's much slower in India, where a third of the population are under 14 years, and when you look at their population growth too, that's pretty significant. Um, and it's also in sub-Saharan Africa, and it's going much more slowly because they have very high birth rates still, uh, where it's, 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 um, it's happening in China, Indonesia, and Turkey. And what this means is that emerging economies have much less time to build financial infrastructure and social security systems to deal with the consequences of ageing, not just health issues, but also the consequences of increased dependency. So that's the burden of disease. Then we have climate change, which Lloyd, you uh, commented on, with the threat of changing weather patterns and re-emergence of some infectious diseases, the increased movement of people, including increased movement to cities as land becomes uninhabitable and or unproductive for food production. These are huge issues in terms of, of global health and global health landscape. And these are matters that can't be addressed by individual countries or governments. We only need to look at the current debate around renewable energy targets to see that it's, it's not possible to address by a particular country or even governments can't agree on them. The last element of change in the global health landscape that I want to talk about is the global health architecture. That may seem a strange word, but this is about the global organisations uh, that shape the global health uh, agenda. Um, so let me talk about the increasing, so there's some major changes there too. There's the increasing significance of philanthropic funding through self-funded foundations. The biggest, of course, being the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, which is what people immediately think of, and, and they are incredibly important. But also, there are not inconsiderable foundations. For instance, there's the Children's Investment Fund Foundation um, in the UK, uh, which was established and endowed by two very successful hedge fund operators. And these foundations are only responsible and accountable to their founding chairs, but they have a considerable influence on the global health agenda and the priorities through their funding. So we can see that with polio uh, and with immunisation, where I spent my last five years working. Bill Gates' passionate commitment is to vaccines. Uh, as people would say, he's a techno geek. Um, and so that's significantly shaped resources, uh, etc. But it's also their political clout. Uh, this is someone who people will argue is not accountable to anyone themselves. Bill Gates can pick up the phone and speak to anyone. He can speak, any world leader will take his, his telephone, any national leader, any leader of business. So they have huge influence. That's, that's a big shift. At the same time, or indeed correlated with it, there's an increasing disenchantment, I think, uh, with UN organisations which were set up post-World War II and reflect that post-World War II environment. 
But the world's changed significantly since then, both politically and economically. I'm not saying there isn't a place for them, but they do operate under what I think are outmoded models. If I could talk a bit about WHO, which is most significant for health and global health, WHO is grappling with all the changes I've outlined above, the economic shifts, the uh, demographic, climate change, etc. Um, population growth, spread of communicable and non-communicable diseases, migration, rising inequities associated with globalisation, failure to improve the social determinants of health. These have often emerged initially in other sectors involving issues that health professionals are unfamiliar with and or they have no influence over. I think it's generally agreed that WHO's strength lies in its unique convening power and global network to call on the best brains in the world. There's no doubt that they can convene at very short notice, absolutely smart, totally informed, deeply um, uh, specialist areas to provide their expertise in complex and deeply technical issues and to set standards and issue guidelines that are globally recognised, and that's important, and respected. So the global brand of WHO remains extremely powerful. But I think it's no doubt, and there are numerous studies and reports to say this, WHO is really too politicised. It's too bureaucratic, um, too dominated by medical staff seeking medical solutions that are often significantly social and economic problems. It's often too timid in controversial issues. It's overstretched in too many directions. And it's too slow to respond and adapt to change. I've worked very closely with WHO over many years, and I have enormous respect for many of the colleagues I worked with there, but they do struggle with the bureaucracy um, and with the difficulty of having a 198-member board, uh, and really decisions end up being lowest common denominator. The other, the other issue is the rise of public-private partnerships, which is a new way of doing business. Um, that reflects not only recognition that governments on their own can't achieve the changes needed, but also a decreasing trust of governments to government working and intergovernmental organisations. Now, I have to acknowledge a bias because, as Lloyd said, I worked for the last 10 years with two of what I consider to be the most exciting global public private health, public private partnerships. And so I saw this all in practice. But um, the there is a huge rise in the need of need to talk in about collaboration and partnerships. So those are the five major changes, I would say, in health. So there's the, the whole change in the economic um, uh, uh, growth and where that growth is. Um, there's the demographic change. There's the burden of disease change. There's a climate change. And there's the global architecture change. There are some changes of global that are outside, but intimately linked with, with global health, globalisation changes, some of these positive changes. And I actually did a bit of a straw poll of some of my colleagues across the world in different agencies and different countries to see what they thought were the, I asked them actually for the three um, most positive things about globalisation for global health and what were the greatest risks. And I got a bit of variety and it was a bit of variety depending on their organisation, uh, on their gender I should say, um, and, and on their location. Um, but there was one uh, area, which none of you will be surprised at, that came out as a really strong positive, and that's the data revolution and lev leveraging it. And it has massive implications for improving information, information flows, feedback, delivery, precision, and accountability. For example, increased ownership of mobile phones uh, and the rapid uh, ability uh, for rapid, remote, and low-cost diagnostics and simple treatment. Uh, it was a whole um, fascinating eye-opener to me when I first moved to Geneva and spent a lot of time in Africa to see that there are mobile phones everywhere. Out in the most remote villages, people have mobile phones. That's the way people communicate. Not telephones, but mobile phones. Um, and you can do wonderful things in immunisation. Um, you can send the data up the line. Uh, so instead of these laborious and sometimes inaccurate transcriptions of big logs in remote clinics, you can send all the data up the line. But also you can do things, so the de demand generation, social mobilisation, you can send reminders to parents down the line to rural and remote communities. Now you and I get these reminders to our doctor's appointment, dentist appointment, so it's probably not new, but actually it's pretty new there and it's pretty exciting to be able to follow up like that. 
on a macro basis, it's now possible to use big data abilities to expand global surveillance and response um, systems to track disease and target solutions, undertake quick impact assessments of whether an initiative is working or not. So that's another huge uh, positive of globalisation. I do have to um, give a note of caution, though, that we have a long way to go. They're, they're there in theory, but whether they're there in practice is another matter. Limitations of data are a constant theme in any discussions that you'd be involved in around global health. Um, discussions around measurement, around the Millennium Development Goals, discussions around the Sustainable Development Goals, the data often isn't there. Um, and in fact, we don't even have vital registration in many countries. So when you don't even have a denominator figure, it's very hard to know what you're working with. So potential, yes, lots of potential, but we've got a long way to go. Uh, a colleague, one of the, th the responses I got from a colleague was that uh, he felt that in an age where nearly everybody has access to mobile phones, where rural farmers are using mobile phones to check grain prices on global markets, where you can get satellite imagery of every community in the world online, and I think the work of the uh, Global Polio Eradication Initiative is fascinating where they use GPSs and actually found villages in India that nobody had any record of existing. So when you have all of that, it's inexcusable that health systems still largely rely on pencils and paper to collect and share data. And any of you who've worked in low-income countries will have seen that. It's all paper and, and pencil. We need to do better. So talking about the data revolution, I'm not even going to start to talk about social media and the huge impact that can have on demand generation, uh, on awareness, etc. Another great, it's another great area. Also an impact on the workplace and ways of working, both positive and negative. The pace is so much faster. If I could go back and say, when I started, when I started working, there were no computers. Um, Everything was done by paper. You had files. When you wanted decisions, you put them on files that were translated up and down the line. I don't even think we had faxes. Um, and uh, so that's how decision making was made. You had to have things typed up in a typing pool. Now everything is instantaneous and the pace is much faster. And when you work in a global organisation, as any of you will know, you're online really 24 hours a day because with different time zones. But, and there's an expectation that if someone sends an email, you're going to respond to it. You're going to see it within the next few hours. Now, that's not always reasonable. But the whole pace and way of working has changed massively. With the data revolution, there are clearly downsides and risks as well. There are concerns about data security and about privacy and about the potential abuse of power with such large volumes of data being available. But I guess that's the nature of emerging technologies and you can't and shouldn't turn back the clock. I mean, it's, it's to be grasped and, and, and used positively. Second one, and then I'm going to wind up, uh, an increased emphasis on strengthening accountability and transparency, which then drives performance. This is not just in the health area, it's right across. Um, being based in Geneva, it was absolutely fascinating to watch the banking saga with UBS. I'm not sure how much it was covered here. And tax havens that unfolded in the courts and therefore in the media. And Swiss, that bastion of banking secrecy, now has legislation which requires everything to be open and transparent and to provide data to countries, etc. Uh, I mean, it was fascinating. In, uh, Trans uh, Transparency International, um, uh, where, you know, it was interesting uh, where you sit in an organisation, it matters. You look at where you sit and it's something that people will judge the organisation on. So, for instance, in Gavi, we looked at where we sat, which was quite good, but actually there was data that we could have made more accessible on the website and it wasn't that we weren't prepared to make it available, we just hadn't done it. But we looked at Transparency International guidelines and we changed it and got rated up. So. There's all these pressures that you can use technology to do it. The use of the corruption index uh, in assessing risk. Um, so it's, uh, it's the, and then on a macro level, if we look at accountability and transparency, the role of MDGs and the role now of sustainable development goals. I guess the jury is still out as to how they will be used, but they are with national leaders signing up to them. I was very sceptical about the Millennium Development Goals, I should say, when they were first developed. But in fact, I've seen them used enormously powerful to lever, uh, lever action and activity. Third one, 
is collaboration across sectors. And I know that's a theme you're going to be discussing across the next few days. Um, I said earlier in relation to changing global health architecture that there's an increasing recognition that in this globally connected world, national governments on their own can't achieve many of the changes needed, nor do they have the resources. Indeed, there are multinationals that have bigger budgets than national budgets. And I do want to stress that in saying this, I'm not saying that national governments can or should abrogate their responsibility for their citizens. Uh, and they remain critical players in this new evolving way of doing business. And this is a topic we could talk about for hours, uh, collaboration and partnership. It's a key theme around sustainable development goals. Um, but I wanted to quote from an interesting report prepared by Accenture called The Convergence Continuum Towards Fourth Sector in Global Development. And I can let Lloyd have the references for this. And what they say in this report is, the digital revolution and innovation in finance are rapidly reshaping the convergent forces that define international development. As new roles, responsibilities, and structures emerge, could a true marketplace for social outcomes, blending the best aspects of private, public, and civil society into a single ecosystem, be the outcome? So is this pie in the sky? Uh, it's, it's talked about a lot. Does it actually happen? As I said, I've had the privilege of working over the last 10 years in what I consider to be the two most exciting global public-private partnerships that reflect that combination. And I'm convinced that this is the way to go. Essentially, we're moving from, or perhaps we still need to move from, rigid organisation or sector-centric view of how development challenges will be solved. But it does require quite a major change in culture and mindset within and across sectors. And I wouldn't underestimate how difficult this is. We can talk about partnerships, we can talk about collaboration. Actually making it happen day to day and making it sustainable is really challenging. So yes, that's the way we have to go, but don't ever think that it's easy. For governments, I think it means shift of funding focus from projects and pilots to platforms and solution across a diverse set of partners. Um, it means engaging the private sector to leverage their capabilities in improving the delivery of healthcare, not simply as a source of funding to NGOs, which was a sort of view of the private sector, write a check, philanthropic. Now it's about actually partnering, drawing on their capabilities, sustainable input. And they have enormous capabilities. If I could use a couple of examples, Global Fund is working with Coca-Cola, who managed to get, as everyone says, their Cokes out cold to the most remote regions, and we're still struggling with how you get vaccines and, and medical commodities out. And in Tanzania, Global Fund is working with Coke to see what they can learn from that. Gavi, we've been working with Vodafone um, in Mozambique uh, in immunisation up and down the line, as I, was, as, as I was saying. We need to be able to then bring these to scale. There's lots of pilots how do we bring them to scale and make them sustainable? The other thing I'd say is that the public sector needs to move, no, no, the public health, no, I'll, I'll qualify that. Parts of the public health community, of which I am one, need to shift their mindset from thinking that anything that has profit in it is evil. Now, I've heard that actually said, you know, you, you wouldn't work with the private sector, but they'll, they'll make money out of it. I can remember actually um, in the Global Fund when we put up the proposal to start the RED campaign. I don't know whether anybody knows what that is, but it was a negotiation with, with high-end private sector groups like um, Armani and Gap and da 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 da, um, that they would commit to providing a percentage of named products um, to the Global Fund for five years, as that was the minimum they had to provide. And in return, they would be able to use that as part of their marketing. And the reaction in the committee of the Global Fund Board was really interesting. It was totally divided. There were a number of people who were really shocked, who said, but they'd be making money out of us. This is absolutely unacceptable. We don't want anything to do with them. So I think that in the, in the public health community, and I know there are concerns about conflict of interest, etc. As long as you manage conflicts of interest, I think that we need to shift from thinking that somehow we have the high moral ground and that um, uh, profit, profit is a dirty word. Um, I wouldn't be so naive as to say that, uh, you know, that, that uh, the private sector is squeaky clean and there aren't some dodgy deals that go on, but I think we need to shift our thinking. The private sector, and I've seen it uh, on boards, etc. 
They're impatient with consultation and policy debates uh, that this sort of partnering involves. And they're actually going to have to shift too. Because to work in collaboration partnership involves development of trust and knowing each other. It means everybody gives up a little bit of their autonomy. So I think the private sector need to shift on that. Um, I think probably that's where I should stop at this stage. I have risks, and I didn't want to finish on risks. Um, I've named some of them, climate change, uh, the current monosectoral government governance systems, the potential downsides of the data revolution. Um, but there are other risks. The movement of people increases the risk of devastating pandemics caused by viruses or multi-drug resistant bacteria, and that also diverts resources uh, and attention from building positive outcomes. So I think with the enormous movement of people now globally as we move, all move around, that is undoubtedly a huge risk. There is a risk that resources won't grow in t in sufficiently to meet growing expectations and demands. Political instability and consequence of massive movement of people, we're seeing that. We see that here in this region. We're certainly seeing it in Europe, from Africa, and from the Middle East. And the danger of that is that it actually, instead of pushing people to think of as global, as global citizens, there's a danger that it'll push, also push countries back into being a lot more protective of their boundaries, and we're seeing that in Europe. So political instability and the consequence of massive movements of people. But I do believe that there are enormous advantages of globalization, and these far outweigh the risks. Um, I'm a bit of a glass half full person. I think you, know, you need to grasp the opportunities. Um, I think that we need to be able to, to do that. We need to be able to embrace disruptive change. This is the new normal. Things are gonna change. You've gotta be prepared for ambiguity and to go out and grasp them and see them as advantages. It does mean new ways of working, a tolerance for ambiguity and preparedness to take on new ideas. And that means risk, and there'll be failures. Um, but when I talked to Lloyd and when I looked at the program and when I heard what was being presented over the next two to three, three, to three days, mapped out by smart, energetic, driven young people, when I looked around at the group here who want to make a difference to health and equity, and when I think of the people that I worked with in the Global Fund, I was by far the oldest when I left. Young, smart, they'd, they'd moved from jobs in the private sector, in banking and accounting, from, moved from right across the world. They'd moved from NGOs, they'd moved from government. Um, I feel that, that this is where the energy, uh, this is where the change is going to occur. It's, you can call it what you like, there's all sorts of definitions you can call it. Uh, you know, the Generation X or I think the next term is Generation Y, the Millennials. But I think that you're, you're actually, you have the future uh, in your hands to make these changes. And I think they're in very good hands. So thank you. <laughs>